My name is Frances Bennett. I live in Kilty Tlaher. Live in the village. We were the butchers there for a hell of a lot of years. And we bought from the local farmers. It was all local. The cattle we needed cheap, whatever lambs, the lot, you know. The fun they had in that place, once upon a time. The laughter and the crack. And they used to pluck turkeys there at Christmas and the fun they had plucking them. Sometimes the... Some of the boys came with a few jars too many and the turkeys were torn and there was war. <laughs> you know, you, it just was, there were great times though, you know, and there was great neighbours and great people in the locality. We had a hell of a lot of, we had a great population here at one time. My name is Tammy McFarlane and we're in Kilty Clogher, County Leitrim. I've been living here nearly five years now. I love it, absolutely love it here. So I've always wanted to live in an area like this. It's surrounded by mountains, lakes, nature. It's beautiful around here. I'm originally from South Africa. So, you know, I grew up kind of in the countryside. This is, this is for me. <laughs> My name is Kieran Rock and I'm the Heritage Officer at Kilty Clogher. And uh, we're in Fermanagh at the moment and we're beside the Kilku River, or known as the County River. And when you look around in this area on the way from Kilty Clogher out, there's a large flood plain, and that's where you get all these spring flowers popping up and you get these wonderful colours that you see around at this time of year and you would see like along the way you would see wild garlic, you would see bluebells, you would see primrose, you would see vetch, you would see bugle orchids coming into life at this time. So you have irises below like which are known as flags in this area, which go they're 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 kind of a banded uh, flower that uh, grows to about one and a half feet high and then a beautiful iris comes out with beautiful flowers, mostly yellow in this area uh, that they are. You would also have um, cow's parsley here, you would have bluebell, you would have marigold, you would have vetch, you would have daisy. So everything's bursting into life, the hazel trees are starting to come out, the birds are whistling and it's a great time of year to be out and about. And we're on the site where St. Patrick actually arrived here. In, in the early centuries, 400 AD. When he came to the Kilku, he apparently, it was at night time in the flood, and all his four followers and friends knelt down on the ground, and his knees are buried in the ground over there in the limestone karst rock, which he prayed for, and eventually a bridge crossed the Kilku River during the night, and they said it was a miracle. So all his followers and himself went to the higher banks across here in the south side, up those cliff edges, and they, they stayed in this area and formed a monastery. This is the story that goes. I do actually enjoy fishing. I'm not really very good at it. <laughs> but years ago, there used to be massive fish in the water. You could literally go out and within an hour you had, you'd have nine huge fish. And in our own Kilku Lake here as well, you would get fish up to about 40 pounds. Um, it was a huge fishing community, so people, you know, that's what people did for sport around here, and it fed families. The local streams were full of trout, full of trout, right up into the mountains. I remember coming home from England as, as a, an older teenager, a younger brother, and, and we'd bring a bucket and we'd go way out. You come back with a half a bucket of trout, like, no problem. We used to catch them sometimes in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of bigger rivers, you know. They'd bring a cat with you and, and a pot of jam and a bucket. And you'd sit the cat on a stone. Now, you know the cat won't go into the water. She'd sit on the stone in the middle with the water. And, of course, there'd be fish about. You'd put a bit of jam on the cat's face. Yeah, and... Uh, you put the bucket in the water in front of the cat with a stone in it that it wouldn't get washed away. And uh, the fly would go for the jam. And as the fly went for the jam, the trout went for the fly and the cat went with the pot to knock the fly away. And they knocked the trout into the bucket. In half an hour you had a bucket full of trout. And there's no fish now. There is no fish. Now you, there's a few trout in the Kilkoo River, few. But they're few and far between. Ah, it's, it's just a shame, but nothing can be done about it now. They'll never come back. Well, my name is Raymond Evans, and this is Upper Loch Machnean. It's very unique because there's seven different breeds of fish in, in Loch Machnean. Uh, there's pike and perch 
and trout and roach and bream and eel and then a hybrid and that's a cross between a perch and a roach or a perch and a bream. So there's lots of different uh, varieties of fish to be caught but I've seen fish here caught, the biggest fish I've seen here caught in my time was 25 pounds but they reckon the years ago that there was 40 pound fish caught, pike caught here. Um, that's what they say, and there is old photographs to prove the fact that there were not waited for him, but there were huge fish. The interest in wildlife around here will be otters, we have deer, we have Dobbinton's bats, we have, um, what else would we have around here? Fox, badger, we would have, uh, in the Arnie catchment we have a, a great creature called the crayfish. All those species that Ireland has known would be along this area. Well, the others are uh, they're at the moment like the, the, some of the young uh, pups are out at the moment in, in Dean's Lake. It just uh, comes uh, the river that comes in here, and they make kind of very very cute sounds like monkeys. <laughs> they make a sound that goes ah 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 ah, <laughs> you know. So it's very nice to hear. Them. Uh, interesting birds around here. There's actually one invasive fellow. He's not too invasive that comes now and again. He's a cormorant and we're very afraid that the cormorants and the seagulls are coming in from the sea. And there was a sighting of a Montague, which is very rare. We also see uh, sparrowhawks. We would also see, we'd have four types of uh, swallow. We'd have the swallow, we'd have the swift, we'd have the sand martin and we'd have the house martin. The heron is here, yeah, he's, he's usually in that river behind me underneath the bridge. The heron was important in old Celtic cu culture for sure. We weren't allowed to eat it. The truth was saying it was, it was sacred not to eat this. This one bird was, was forbidden at the time, you know. And it would also be used in the actual field. The filioc to all the poets of Ireland would also ha they have a competition at one stage to be the, the chief or hive poet. And they would wear a mantle of of feathers, native feathers, and his feathers would have been on the, on the crown or on the shoulders of this mantle. Mm -hmm. My name is Joseph Sheeran from Kilty Clogher County Leitrim. I'm part of Kilty Clogher Heritage Centre. We are currently on Dhu Mountain. Dhu and Thur are national heritage sites. It, the mountain here is a flat plateau and it goes on for a few miles. Uh, in that right over towards Loch McNean. It's vital that the whole area is preserved because of the richness of the habitats uh, that it has. On the eastern side, it's got steep slopes and that's where the sand martins are nesting in. The most important native species around here is the marsh harrier. There's also golden eagles to be found here. The Irish hare, it's rich in red grouse, in the curlew, in snipe, in skylark, in meadow pipits, in the cuckoo, in the buzzards. The bog is so rich in other creatures. The decomposition of those creatures and the vegetation as goes into creating the bogs. 14% of the land in Ireland is bog. It holds over 50% of the carbon sink of the country. Bogs are one of the rarest ecosystems in the world. Its Irish bogs are particularly important because we have one of the largest areas of bogland in Europe and it's vital that we maintain that. In past generations, the bogs were under threat by our predecessors cutting turf. Currently, it's under threat by building wind farms. This is an example of sphagnum moss. We can see here how the moss changes in colour and the, how it mix combines with the heather and then it gets lighter in colour and then this is the start of the foundation, the gradual formation of the bog itself where it turns into peat. You can see how the roots gradually extend into the bog itself and then over hundreds of years it, the carbon is building up and therefore that's what you call the carbon bank. Uh, the, the moss itself it retains over 20 times its weight in water. There's a gradual release of the water down into the water basin. That prevents flooding downstream in times of heavy rain. Otherwise, 
the water, it goes straight down into the rivers and cause flooding in our towns and villages. But you can see the water now is very brown at the moment. Now that's coming down from the bog, it's coming down from two bogs, it's coming down from the bog on Dew Mountain and it's coming down from the bog on Tor. And along the way it's going through farmland, so it's picking up a lot of sediment along the way. This is not good, but we need filtering. There is a certain amount of discharge that would be, would be good in the river, but we'd also like to stop some of those uh, discharges that come from humans. And that's what we would be looking at over the, over the next 10 years, hopefully around here, to see how we can help people and get the water quality up. I'd say the greatest pressure at the moment probably would be the people always go after the farmer because they look for nitrate but that's like beating them up but mostly it's the state itself around here because the state controls most of the land so that would mean that the forestry it would be all those companies that they would use in private uh, uh, contractors and likes would probably have some education on the land but maybe not enough to actually go into something as delicate as this. So the riparian area would be the trees and the trees would actually, they would actually solidify the bank and stop it meandering so much so you could actually manage the river properly if you leave the trees and carefully cut them. They also shade the area keeping the water temperature down in summer because some of the creatures that live in water cannot go above certain temperatures and would die or have to uh, migrate. So having trees is very important for shading along the river. You have, a, you have a joint heritage between north and south in the river itself. And on this side on the north you can see that there's still trees and you have all this lovely uh, flora and wildlife that exist there. On the far side we've had uh, a removal of the trees and a removal of that flora which is now causing problems for uh, life itself. In the river temperature will raise higher. You will also have extra sediment from all this tree cutting and from all this movement of heavy machinery. And the area has been cleared from here in Kilty Clatter all the way, the whole bank has been cleared all the way to the Melbourne, the whole way down. So that means it's about 30 feet in from the water has been devoid of life for the last few weeks. There may be signs of small growth growing at the moment, but it would have been just like something from the psalm. So everything was destroyed all the way down. So what we did have was an influx of bats coming into houses in Kilty Clutter and we had rats and mice and we had seen rabbits on the streets, badgers in movement. We would see all the creatures, birds, all that were nesting had to move as well. So this would be a great disturbance for our ecosystem and would have a detrimental effect on us in this area. We have a number of invasive species as well along this area. Along in the Arnie we have quite a lot of rod rhododendron that supposedly came from um, Tottenham's uh, Demean there in Glenfarn and spread out wild, you know, so they're a very exotic plant, but they're all over Ireland, so I don't think they only came from there. And we also have mink in the area, and they would, this would have a, a detrimental uh, impact on, say, ground nesting birds and duckling along the water's edge. Yeah, we also have zebra mussel, which is also including, it's, 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 it's in the area, but they're keeping it out by, there's a great campaign to wash your boat and wash your boots. As you can see our wellies, we'll be watching our wellies as we walk around here, that we're not going from catchment to catchment and bringing the invasive species with us as we go. Clacher is rich in its heritage of its birthplace of Sean McDermott. It's rich for its traditional music and singing. And also it's close to the border, so we've got very good cross-border relations. And that's where the urn catchment comes in. It's a, it's a means of growing up those relations between people north and south of the border.